Hi, everybody. Hi. We ready? Go live. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Rave. My name is Eric Smith. I'm the owner and president of Redwood Art Group. We are so happy that you're joining us this evening and tomorrow and all through the month of December, we hope. Uh, we've got quite a lineup for tonight. The purpose of Rave is to keep our community together. The collectors like you, the artists, and the galleries. We've got over 120,000 collectors on our, in our subscriber base. We've got 7,000 exhibitors and thousands of artists. And with this pandemic, it's prohibited us from doing our live events. We usually do seven a year. We haven't done any this year. The last event we did was in Miami in December during Art Basel week. We did Red Dot and Spectrum. So it's been a hard year for the artists and a hard year for my company, in fact. Uh, this pandemic has had a toll on us. And we're gonna talk about that in a bit. Um, the purpose of RAVE is to create a positive virtual experience and really get to know the artists in the galleries. So oftentimes during our shows in San Diego and Santa Fe and the Miami events and you know New York, you're just kind of busy walking around, you're with friends, you have a glass of champagne or wine and you know, uh, you, you buy art, you sell a lot of art at the events, but oftentimes you don't really get to hear the stories from the artists and, and the depths from which they've come. <laughs> and uh, Dave and I are gonna talk about that in a bit. Uh, it is, you know, they're, they're compelling stories. And uh, I was talking to a couple artists the other day and it was pretty emotional. So I think you're gonna enjoy the evening. I wanna tell you a little bit how the rave site works. So kind of pretend that we're on the main stage right now. So I'll be bringing guests in and we'll be talking about things. But during the course of that, if you feel, you can feel free to shop around the site. You can go to, um, uh, uh, exhibitor booths, and uh, you can uh, go to our sponsor page, which is on About Us, and then click Sponsors. You can just kind of mill around the site and look around. Laura, who's in, behind the scenes with us here, has done a great job building the site, and thank you for that, Laura. So if you want to get in touch with an artist, you can go to their booth, scroll to the bottom, and there's guest book and just fill that out. And because some of you might not be buying right now, some of you will be buying right now. In fact, we've had inquiries over the last couple of days about purchasing pieces. And you can just fill in the guest book and, and connect with that artist and in the future buy, that's fine too. I'm gonna to announce that there's free freight on every piece of art shipped within the United States. And uh, we're, we're, we're happy about that. You're gonna meet artists today from Northern Canada to California and France to Florida. And before we start, I have poured a glass of champagne and a toast to all of you that are joining us tonight. Thank you. And I wanna give a shout out to Pomery Champagne, a French company, and I'm gonna do a little blip for them right now. They're our sponsor and you can find them by going to About Us Sponsor and then see their, uh, their booth there. So Pomery is a delic, uh, Madame Pomery based the expansion of her house on the creation of wines unlike any others with one constant demand, quality pushed to the extreme. Pomery is a delicacy in liveliness, heart and soul a style made of finesse, which plays a score focusing on the elegance of the aromas rather than on their strength. Mason Pomery has been a major player in the arts since its inception. To stay faithful to the memory and the will of Madame Pomery, they continue exhibiting contemporary art as the main thrust of their patronage. And I can tell you that uh, I have taken a tour, a uh, virtual tour of their uh, estate and you go down below into the caverns and you expect to see wine down there and champagne and what you see is contemporary art and it's absolutely fantastic. 
So Laura, let's bring in Dave, Navarro, and Padilla and kick this thing off. Hi, Dave. How are you? Hi, Padilla. Thanks Quick for having us. It's an honor to be here, man. Yes, it really thank is. You. It really is. Well, thanks for coming. Quick introduction. Dave is a well-known musician, activist, and artist. He is here today with Padilla as part of the collaborative art project, Dual Diagnosis. Padilla is a Los Angeles-based street artist, designer, and writer. Her work can best be described as psychological commentary. So a little background before we start. As I said earlier, we've all been through a pretty tough year. And, you know, Dave and I and Padilla were talking the other day and, and uh, you know, with COVID-19, the pandemic, as well as the election and job layoffs. And, you know, it, it, personally, even my company, we, we got through about June and decided we're not gonna be able to produce any events. And, you know, uh, I have 15 employees and, you know, everybody's kind of on furlough. So it's been pretty tough. And I found myself getting depressed a few times this year, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, Dave and Padilla have a really good story about dual diagnosis. And I, I wanna talk about that a bit and then we'll have some fun. We'll meet some fantastic artists and we're gonna take a tour through Dave's house and see some of his collection. So Dave, why don't you tell us a little bit about dual diagnosis? Well, I, uh, I initially discovered Padilla's work on the street. I, I saw a piece of hers and I, I think I just reached out to her. Yeah, it said, love me anyways. Yeah, it said, love me anyways. <laughs> and I was like, I love that. So I reached out to her yeah. and uh, I bought a piece from her and we, we became super tight. Did you move a Warhol to hang it or did I make that part up? You, you can believe that. <laughs> she can you. believe that. I That's think. how I tell it. But uh, yeah, you can tell that in the story. But I... I um, and we really hit it off as friends and as artists and started uh, just collaborating almost instantly. And, you know, both Padilla and I suffer from mental disorders and, and, and struggle with, you know, I personally with drug addiction, with uh, depression, bipolarity, you name it. Padilla has her own set yeah. of circumstances. Uh, I'm more, more PTSD, depression, anxiety. Yeah, and we both really mirror each other in that way and we connected on that. And we started, we started toying with the concept of if it had not been for these, these maladies in our lives, we would not have some of the gifts that we have in our lives. And those are the things that have helped us push through the struggle and create. And we decided to create I don't even know what you would call it because dual diagnosis, we, we are a clothing line for sure, but we're more than that. We do installations, we do fine art, we do uh, street art, we donate, we don't, you know, we do charitable, charitable work. And, and our message really is to try and help lift the stigma off this mental illness thing being a sad, shameful, horrible thing. And in fact, if you're surviving with it and working towards it, that you're actually a hero and great strengths come from it. And I always talk to people about that. I go, Vincent Van Gogh would have been locked up today yeah. as a lunatic, but he didn't. And now we get to see his works and part of his genius was his insanity. And I think that when you, we decided to just tap in and express and own what's going on with us, this whole world evolved for us. And uh, Padilla can be more specific in terms of, of broadening that out, but we really, we really connected on just creating something that we were proud of, that we thought was cool, that made our maladies strengths as opposed to weaknesses and as a result, this whole, this whole thing, this whole multimedia thing that we're doing has evolved. If you want to chime in on, on, on some more about it. Yeah, I mean, I would say um, we're kind of working to create a, a reframe here, you know, because th there are cultures where if you're schizophrenic, uh, they believe that you have one foot in two worlds and you know isn't that beautiful and isn't that enchanting don't you want to know someone like that yeah. you know um instead of our culture here where it's it's disease and and fear 
Um, and it's the same thing with bipolar. Anybody that I've known personally in my life who's just a powerful uh, visionary, artist, creator, musician, whatever, um, has they've all been diagnosed with bipolar. And it's heartbreaking to see them go through their life feeling lesser and broken yeah. and shame when in fact they have this incredibly beautiful creative energy running through them which is their genius and it's their it's their superpower so overall you know what we're working to accomplish here is to create a shift in our culture where we stop pathologizing our mental differences and instead celebrate the beauty of uniqueness yes and well, i can i could also add in that in that uh, in terms of what what video is talking about that the people who have influenced me in my life artistically and musically by and large every single one of them struggled with something yeah every single one of them from you know from rothko to hendrix do you know what i mean like these are the people what yeah totally yeah, yeah. so like the, to, to me those are my heroes and all my heroes are people who have similar things that we share and why not use those tools to no. grow and to help other people say, you know, I do have this thing, I do have this malady, but maybe I can I can hone it into something beautiful and, and share that with the world and, and and pass on hope. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and you know, we separate out people um, who who struggle with depression, anxiety, and trauma, and we label them as mentally ill, and you know, we put them over there. Um, and that's a problem because, because of stigma and shame. Um, but it's also just not true. There is no <laughs> separate diseased population that struggles with those things. Those things are just aspects of the human experience. And we all go through them at different points in our lives and in different ways. Those are the things that connect us and that make us human. Yeah. Talk a little bit about how you were saying that we're not just about the mental health aspect that everybody yeah, so, who feels like an outsider is a member of our club. Yeah, so <laughs> exactly. Well, my goodness, I mean, you know, Dave, we were talking about uh, your, the flyers you made for your band and, you know, tell us that story about, I mean, artists are the same way. They come to our shows and they're standing sure, sure, sure. Let me just let me just finish up. Let me let Priya finish up the last thing we were saying, and then I'll tell you that. Uh, yeah. yeah, I just I just wanted to say, you know, beyond uh, mental illness, this project is for people who are just different. You know, um, not so much in LA, but in most other parts of the country, there is a very narrow range of acceptable ways to be and to live and to behave. Mm -hmm. And if you don't fall within this, you know, electric fencing of this narrow margin, you're ostracized, you're bullied, you're scary, you're weird. And so with this project, you know, we're hoping to reach those people and to make them feel proud and to celebrate that they're that they're wildly different. And they have family. Yeah. And family. That, yeah. Exactly. And they yeah. will be part of our family. And and the thing about dual diagnosis is you don't have to buy a t-shirt to be a part of our family. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that's not where, what we're about. You can walk down the street and, and see some street art or fine art or whatever you want. And you, it's free. The messaging is free. We have a, a manifesto and a short film on our www.dualdiagnosis.com site where it's all explained and we're just giving it away. If you want to wear it, that's cool too. Our wearable but, proclamations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, when you were talking about the Jane's Addiction early flyers, so my introduction into the art world, I grew up, my dad was senior vice president at Gray Advertising, which meant I had a drafting table and blades and Letraset and all the old school tools of, of, of making uh, layouts at home. So seven, eight, nine, ten years old, I'm sitting at a drafting table with a blade and let her set and making up my own stuff. So when Jane's Addiction came around, it came time to hand out flyers. Like we took great pride in our flyers. We handmade them and we were taping pieces of, of words that we cut out of magazines because I needed I needed a dress for the Roxy so or for the rainbow. So 
I had to cut it out and tape it on there or use, back then it was rubber cement with the erasable rubber cement. Love that, still use it. But, uh, and then I would go to, a, my dad was in advertising, I would go to his office and Xerox off the flyers that we handmade. And the, the most humbling and, 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 uh, and I think back, and I think back to funny stories is that Perry Farrell and I used to go hand flyers out that we physically made Oh my God. Get people to come see our bands. And, you know, if, if you were around when flyers were coming out and it wasn't just an Instagram post, the artist himself had to physically hand it to you. So we were physically handing things to people and they look at it, they drop it, they crumple it up and throw it back at us. I mean, it was like, it was the most humbling experience. And like, to, I'm so grateful for that because it lit our fire. We were like, fuck these guys, they're not getting it. We're gonna make sure they get it. You know what I mean? And I think that, I think that we did, you know, in a small way. So, um, but that, that, that question ties into like my introduction into being into graphically an artist and then how using imagery in conjunction with music was such an imperative part of Jane's Addiction's whole, uh, just whole scene. I mean, I think of Jane's Addiction as a, as a touring art installation, not as a rock band. And um, so that, that to me was my early days. And then, and then I grew up and got older and I got into oil painting and my, my OCD wouldn't allow me to get oil paint everywhere because it gets everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that an ex oil painter with OCD would form dual diagnosis to still be creative, but not have to worry about the, the, you know, my paintings drying for 30 days. Right. You need spray paint and something quick. Yeah. I want instant. I want fast. And, and when it comes to stuff on the street, I just, I, I love watching the deterioration. Yeah. It's a fascinating medium on so many levels. And that's one of them, the deterioration, it becomes, uh, you know, there's so many iterations that it goes through. Yeah. It becomes its own. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You can drive all over LA and see. Yeah. Well, yeah, but you can put something up and then drive by it a next a week later and it looks completely different and other people have put stuff up and the rain fucked up your paste or your paint or whatever it is. And it's like, you're like, wow, that looks fucking cool. I wish I did that originally. But you get <laughs> ideas from watching the deterioration. Like even things you don't want to happen inform the next thing. You just have to be open to all those things. Right. Yeah, you have to let go of all control. Or yeah, gonna it's like it. it's like I always tell Padilla when we're working and we hit us, we hit a struggle. I always tell her, or like we hit something that we don't think we can get past. I always bring up Bruce the shark yeah. from Jaws because when Steven Spielberg made Jaws, that shark did not work, which is why we don't yeah. see it for two thirds of the film. And because we don't see it for two thirds of the film, it is much scarier and he had to make it work. And so like, there's always Bruce the shark somewhere in every mistake and you just gotta be willing to find it. <laughs> well, how about we see, uh, we're gonna play a video and you're gonna kind of tour us through your, your house and some of the pieces you've collected, right? Yeah, okay, so these are some collectibles that, that I've acquired over the years. This is my favorite, one of my favorites, Robbie Canal. Uh, the original contradiction uh, Reagan painting. Uh, and that that was the first piece of street art that I saw as a kid that spoke against the government. And I realized that, wow, we're allowed to have a voice on the street. And it inspired me. This is Richard Hamilton, also known as the Shadow Man. One of the greatest uh, artists of that scene with Basquiat and Warhol and Herring. And he just got lost in his own insanity. And uh, it's a, one of my prized possessions. This is my buddy Thrashbird is a, is a wonderful street artist and a brilliant guy. Up there you'll see Cornbread and uh, there's Bells of St. Mary's Warhol. This is Miss Me who did uh, this wheat paste on my bedroom door. So imagine inviting women into there. They're not really <laughs> stoked about it, but uh, and then this is a local guy, Fiend Club LA who just does these original Silk screens, every one of them's different. This is Al Diaz, Samo, the other half of Samo, Basquiat and Al Diaz. So I had him come and he blasted in my house. 
uh, speaking of the Warhol connection, you know, I've always had a fascination with that. And, and so here we have some of the Maryland's, the black Maryland being my prized possession, I guess, of the collection. That to me is the grail. But to me, it all speaks to the, the Warhol factory scene more than just the imagery. There's, there's history behind it. A current guy, Free Humanity, did those hearts and he's, he's a fine artist as well. This is Jamie Reed who designed the Sex Pistols cover. So again, music and art coming together in a really, really profound way that's iconic. Very simple, uh, hand-drawn Basquiat right there, which I paid very little for in the 80s. This is another Al Diaz Samo piece. And you can see Danny Manick on the walls. This is Chaz Bjorquez. And forgive me if I mispronounce his name, one of the greatest all time uh, writers and, and, and artists. And I, I think that even Retina studied under him. This is a shepherd fairy that he made for me because he loves our band so much. And there's one of the original Keith Haring uh, chalk drawings from the subways. Wow. And, and you know, that those to me, they just, they just go together, they're saying the same things. And here's the electric chair suite. When, I'm sorry about the glare, I couldn't afford museum glass. With what these things cost, and then you, they charge you for museum glass, you're like, fuck that. Um, but so, so this is the full suite. It's, it's the 10 electric chairs, and I found the, the juxtaposition of the color and the, and the imagery being so mind-blowing. This is Ethan uh, Armin, who is an eight-year-old. He was, I think he was five or eight when he drew that. And so those were wee paste that I was seeing all over town. And uh, I was just so floored by them because they had this freedom to them, this Basquiat freedom to them. And when I found out that it was a child that had drawn the original, the original piece, I was like, no wonder, because that kid's out of his head. He's not thinking, he's not judging as he goes. That's why it resonates. That's why it's true. And so I reached out to his dad and his dad put those up in my house. And no. I mean, that's just a small tour. You can see behind me the Al Diaz piece right there. Um, and right here is a little piece by Teacher who's just one of the most amazing stencil cutters I've ever seen. Um, I mean, I can go on for days about the house, but uh, no, no, it's totally cool. I really want this thing to be a time capsule of all the art that I love and the people who've inspired me and, and, uh, and have it stand long past my death for people to come in and look at as a snapshot into this, the era that we're living through, much like if I could go back and look at the Nixon era and the art that was coming out of that in one structure, I want this to be that. I like that, curating your own collection. Yeah. Sure. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, it's, it's, well, it, I, I don't even have to curate it because when I curate stuff, then it's for hopefully for other people to enjoy. For me, it's just like, I like that and it's going here, you know, and it's not for anybody else. I'm glad to share it with you, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't call it curated. I would just say that I'm gravitated towards the stuff I love. I got to throw some art terms out there once in a while, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, that makes sense. <laughs> All right, so for those of you watching, I'm gonna ask you uh, to check out three booths here on the rave site right now. And, uh, you know, like I said earlier, you can kind of do that uh, while you're still listening to us. Those three booths are dual diagnosis, life after death, and Padilla, Padilla's booth page is unfuck yourself. So those are the three booths that you should check out now. But it's U-N-F-U-K yourself. U -N -F -U -K. Forgive me, mom. Just to, well, I don't want them to search it and not find it. And also she cleaned it up for the kids. That's, that's kind of nice. Right. So it's less <laughs> offensive. Less offensive without the C somehow. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Dual Diagnosis made a super cool video. I was blown away by it. I, I thought it, was, it looked so professional. It looked like something you would see at like, I mean, at Art Basel, uh, you know, like you walk into a video room and see this. It was so well done. Uh, and we're saving that to the end of the event today. We're going to play it. It's the last thing we're going to exit with. And I want everybody to hang on to that. And, and, uh, and then we'll post it on our, our site so you can Thank see you. it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think the thing about the video that's so important is it really gives an inside peek as to 
what we're doing that this is not a merch company. Yeah. Like we really take our time and care and hand make every little thing, including everything you see in that movie, Padilla and I handmade. And we came up with the concept and we, we wanted that we've created two heroes that are characters insulated in their own environments because they're so terrified of the outside world. Yeah. That's why they're in these weird suits, which are actually dive suits from the 19, from the 1700s. So we refurbished them and uh, our friend Lainey Chantal created them, recreated them beautifully. And she's an amazing effects uh, designer and, and costumer. So if you get a chance, check her out too. But she did all that, all those, and, and we made the rest and uh, we plan to make more films yeah. and set up more installations so people can walk around in those films. Yeah, there's so much in that. I think it's three minutes, right? I mean, there's just so much. Getting that down to three minutes was a nightmare. Yeah. You know, it's like in the editing room, they say you got to kill your babies because you fall in love with something, but it's just too long. And you're like, this has to go. I mean, I would have made that thing six hours long if I had my way. Right. Yeah. <laughs> We're just trying to articulate these, you know, kind of obscure aspects of the human experience. Um, you know, things that people all feel, but don't really yeah. have words for. And in doing that, you know, create a, just a greater sense of connection. But in Cliff Notes terms, if you just remember this, if you do hang out to see the film, that film is really just about two really tragically traumatized souls that find each other and use their trauma to create their own reality of beauty that they're happy in. Yeah. And that's exactly what we're doing. So on a weird level, those two little animated figures are Padilla and I. Yeah, I got that. And at the end, the color that's brought back into it is spectacular. So Those are all made out of handmade Rorschach inkblot designs that we did and built little figures out of them. So our logo is the Rorschach design because it's such an archaic, you know, he, he told his patients that there's no wrong answer looking at those ink blots. But if you said, if you looked at an ink blot and said, I see a man smashing a woman in the face, he'd lock you up. Mm -hmm. So there is a wrong answer, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But so we're playing on a lot of the ancient archaic ways that psychiatry and, and, and healing was forced on people. And we're also just kind of lifting the stigma. And one brilliant thing that Padilla always says is that when military people, when military soldiers come home after seeing horrific events, right? And they, the things that they have had to see and the PTSD that they have to deal with and they are honored and they are awarded and they are revered. Well, people suffer like that all around the world all the time, maybe not in war zones, um, but they suffer on those levels and the PTSD, which lives in the body is just as real, which is why our jackets are military jackets that are old vintage jackets from Vietnam, because we know that whoever wore that jacket then saw the most unimaginable trauma, yet the jacket came back and we're still gonna use it to celebrate him or her and what we're doing. Amen. Well, thanks, you guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask Dave and Padilla to stick around for our next session. Laura, can we bring in uh, Risk and Gatsby? I'm so excited about this next session. I love that. In the next session, we're going to talk more about oh, That's pretty nice. That's, that's really nice. Yeah, thanks, guys. I'm really excited about this one. <laughs> <laughs> what are we the opening band here come on <laughs> i only say that because when i started in the art business you know, this is the stuff that i was selling so yeah. i'm fucking with you man that's just my sense of humor it means i like you good so uh let me introduce risk risk is a multi-talented artist sculptor and graffiti pioneer kelly risk Graval has been synonymous with the Los Angeles art community for over 30 years. He has solidified his place in the history books as a world-renowned graffiti legend and contemporary artist. Welcome, Risk. And Gatsby is a conceptual artist based out of Florida whose work focuses on causes that are important to him. His work covers topics ranging from animal welfare and conservation, addiction, racial injustices, and more. Welcome, Gatsby. Hey, nice to be here tonight. Thank you. What's up, buddy? Is that your studio? 
It is. Awesome. Good to see you, man. Good to see you too. Well, if, if I could, if I could if I could just say to Gatsby really quick, um, one of the things I love so much about his work is is his references, which I do a lot of referencing childhood imagery and having a new slant on it and making it so we're awakened with these new concepts as adults based on imagery that we learned as as children. But I'll let him take it away. But I just want to say. Love your stuff, bud. Thanks, man. Yeah. That's really cool. I met Gatsby a number of years ago, and uh, one of the things I admire about him is his, let's see, he just does what he wants to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start Instagram and Dave Navarro and see where he goes, and all of a sudden, connect. And you know you're, you're you're an inspiration for that. You just yeah, but here's it. the thing: people can Instagram me, and if they're not coming from the same place, there ain't no connect. Right. And that is not an invitation for people to Instagram me and connect with. Me. <laughs> right. I'm just saying when when I saw his work, it was just like a no brainer. Anyway, yeah. I'm gonna mute and shut up and let you guys take it away. I think uh, what Dave's saying is everybody slide into Dave's DMs tonight. <laughs> So uh, uh, we're here to talk about the expansion and the kind of the magnified interest in the graffiti and street movement. Uh, I'm going to give you a little background about myself and it, well, not really about myself, but how I learned about it. Uh, I got into the art business in the mid eighties and uh, working for a gallery chain and, and managed 15 plus galleries. And uh, we represented Keith Herring and Andy Warhol and uh, uh, Kenny Scharf, uh, Crash, Futura 2000. And uh, I absolutely fell in love with all of those artists and continue to, you know, watch the prices of some of them and, and, and it totally enjoy seeing the, the more contemporary and, and uh, the primary work that's coming out of the market like yours, Gatsby and Risk Day in the uh, dual diagnosis. So, with that said, uh, let's talk about uh, how did you get into this, Gatsby, and why? You know, it's funny. Uh, I, I kind of think I've been an artist all my life, but I didn't start painting until about four years ago. I watched Exit Through the Gift Shop, and I grew up in a, an extremely religious, repressed household, right? And the type of art that I liked was, was never encouraged. So I, I didn't think that I had any artistic ability and, and really didn't have an interest in, in visual art. You know, I love music, but as far as visual art, nothing had really caught my interest until I watched that movie. And it, sh it, it shifted my lens on how I looked at art. That art wasn't about the image or your ability to draw it, that it was about an idea. And, you know, that Banksy could say so much with so little and the irreverence of it all, right? Like, uh, it's very fun to say fuck you to the establishment, be able to kind of get away with it or even celebrate it for it. And, and I fell in love. And uh, ever since then, uh, it's, it's all that I do. Uh, I'm almost like a hermit. But can I interrupt you, Gatsby, and talk about, don't you wish you could see the finished brainwash edit of Exit Through the Gift Shop? I mean, that was pretty fucking cool, I have to say. A hundred percent. And, and you was, know what's yeah. cool is the fact that like now it's almost like he's a, a walking piece of art, right? Because it's an ongoing art project, really, right? With yeah, but I'm a fan of his editing. I'm more a fan of his editing. That's the <laughs> <great part. laughs> Maybe he'd collab with you on the next uh, video for dual diagnosis. I'm thinking, don't worry. Yeah. Hey, right. Nice, beautiful. <laughs> Let's get let's get risk take on this. So hey risk, did you uh, why don't you tell us how you got started? Uh, you know I got started. How did I get started? I, I used to surf a lot. Uni high school, I used to surf a lot. I drew waves and uh, pictures and stuff. And this guy from New York came. Wait, risk. What what school did you say you went to? Uni. Okay. Uni. Uni. Okay. Uni. I think you. Did yeah, you I went there too. Yeah, it's kind of wonderful when that we were we were there at the same time. It had to have been. Probably. I had art class at uni. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> what was the name of that school? University. 
yeah, University High School. It's on the west side of California, LA, and it's just like a public school. And uh, that's awesome. I didn't know that. Yeah, and they had one of the best tennis teams because they kicked our butt when I, I went to Chatsworth High and they beat us every year. I didn't even know we that, had to. nothing on us. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Brent. I, saw, I took pictures and this guy came and said, you know, what do you write? And I didn't know about the, the subculture of graffiti. I was like, I don't write. I draw fucking pictures. And he kept asking me, I'm like, I draw pictures, man. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't write. And he told me what writing was. I went out that day. I stole some spray paint. I went to my school. I couldn't wait till it was nighttime. So I jumped the fence, did a piece on the bungalows. It was terrible. And the next day, there's like 100 kids around going, it's so fucking cool. I'm like, that's cool? And they go, yeah. And I loved all the fucking publicity and shit. So I kept doing it. I got kind of decent. And there was like not a lot of surfer kids that got in a lot of trouble at uni high. So they caught me like that. And I had to change my name to Risk. And that's been it ever since. That's awesome. Yeah, all of us grew up in Southern California. So surfing was a big part of the culture, that's for sure. Oh, yeah, the whole, I mean, I was a big, you know, if you remember the Dogtown days, Jay Adams and Tony Alva and all those dudes, those guys were also my heroes. The, the, the skate scene and the surf scene really informed all of us, I'm sure, because that's what we lived in those days. And it was, and, right. and that was using our bodies for expression, you know, and now, being much older, thank God we don't have to do that. <laughs> we don't have to do that. <laughs> and the motor and the MX bicycle, Bob Harrow came out with the MX bicycle and all that. It was very popular there. Yeah, BMX. I was super into that. That was like the shit. Dude, I had a mongoose. That was my shit. They <laughs> sold me when they told me it was made out of the aluminum alloy that NASA yeah. uses. And, the and paint it was like, up like a sheet. You remember the paint yeah. up like a sheet? Yeah, I had to have it. And if I kept one of the four Volkswagen vans I had, I'd be so happy today, but I didn't. Um, so let's throw a question out there. What do you feel uh, is the importance of graffiti and street art? Risk? Uh, I think it's super important because it's, it's the last hand to medium to surface art form. Because after this, it gets digital and all that stuff. So to me, it's like, it's it's the last real craftsman art form, you know? So I think that's just incredibly important. Besides it being a social commentary, wow. uh, you know, like the Mocha show, uh, Beyond the Streets, that had, Art in the Streets, sorry, that had the biggest turnout of the museum in, in forever. So it's the first time in 100, 100 years that we have so many young people into art, you know? And I think that's a direct correlation between graffiti and street art. I agree. Gatsby, how about you? I mean, who's to say how, how much it actually influenced the, this past election that just went by, right? Like, I don't know how many of you guys have watched Art of Protest, but, you know, one of the things that, like, Dave Rob Shepard Ferry earlier that I've always admired about him is, I mean, his artwork, it, and it doesn't even appeal to me visually, but I love it so much because he's been able to do so much with it, right? Like, he was able to help get Obama elected. I think all five of the Congresswomen that were just selected he produced their campaign art and it's just incredible with what he's been able to accomplish with it and you know how, how it might get some people to uh care that wouldn't have even really been paying attention before yeah can i, I chime in can i chime in on that real quick yeah because for me when i saw that robbie canal piece and it said contradiction and it was against the administration i was maybe 13 years old the reagan piece I'm sorry? The Reagan piece? Yeah, I have the original painting here, like the original painting that he did for those prints. That's what I just showed. But um, for me, it's, it's, if someone's going to a museum, if someone's going to a gallery, if someone's going to an Instagram page, they pretty much want to see who they're looking at. And I like not giving people a choice. I like it. I like that you have to, you don't have a choice. And here's the thing about that is that the world is full of signage and everywhere you look, it's something that wants your money everywhere. It's a commercial, it's a fucking billboard, it's a fucking restaurant, it's a hotel getaway. You know what I mean? Whereas what we're doing is free, it's an alternative view and it's impactful. And you brought up Art of Protest, Gatsby, and I helped produce that with both the In Decline guys because it was so important to get that out prior to the election because the whole, the whole scope of the film is In Decline 
taken out Trump, right? But we were running out of time and the election was gonna happen. So I stepped in and I was like, no, this has to come out now. We need to get this thing out now before the election, because nobody's going to give a shit about taking out Trump if he's already out. So, well, and you I, know, Rolling Stone for helping uh, get that out too, right? Didn't yeah. you pitch that for a long time and nobody had the balls to actually stream it or, or air it? Yeah, and it went streaming for free and, yeah. uh, and remains that way. It's at rollingstone.com for anybody who wants to check it out. And it's a really great inside look at what goes into the planning and the process and, and some of the takeovers that these guys do. And I'm really big on environmental takeovers and taking over a space and using three dimensional aspects of it. And these guys are the kings of it. So I highly recommend the film. All right. Well, I mean, uh, I have seen a big influx of graffiti and street work at our shows over the past you know, four or five years. And Dave, you and I were talking about it the other day. I mean, those electric chairs you have, I don't know what they're priced at today, but I was selling them in the mid eight, you know, in the eighties of fifteen hundred dollars. I think they were fifteen. And that's that's a lot because when they were made, they were like fifty. Yeah. <laughs> you sold them in head shops. <laughs> yeah. Which were those, so they were yeah, where you could like get like you know black light posters and fucking a bong and a Warhol print. <laughs> I mean, it was just fucking crazy. And the, the Keith Haring pop shop pieces we were selling at like nine hundred dollars, you know. And today those are anywhere from fifteen to twenty five thousand. It's just amazing. So once once Keith got on a swatch, yeah, it was over. <laughs> I remember that. I do. I was like, he's Keith Haring, man. Put him on a Patek Philippe. Put him. <laughs> put him on a Rolex. Don't put him on a swatch. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Well, it's a great movement, and that's what I like to call it, the graffiti and street, the street art and graffiti movement, because it is a movement, and it's been going on for, let's see, 35 years now, if not more, 40 years, right? I mean, Risk, you were painting in the late 70s, early 80s? Uh, early 80s, 83. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're younger than me. So, <laughs> um, you know, out there on the street, and, and yeah, it's a, it's a terrific movement, and I look forward to watching where your work goes, Gatsby's work and dual diagnosis. So Oh Eric, one last one last thing while we're here. You were asking me about the uh, print that we're collaborating on for people. And it's right behind me here. Uh, in progress still. The the dual diagnosis guys still have to do their thing on, so I'm excited to see what they do. But Yeah. Yeah, well, we thought we'd release a print for people who can't be there and just, you know, just a cool little collab that's a one-off, you know, and just to kind of say, hey, man, I'm sorry that we can't all get together this year, but here's something that you can have and it's not going to be expensive. And it's just, a, and that was Gatsby's idea. That's a great fucking idea. Oh, I love the idea. In fact, one thing right, that, don't get so sad you eat all your pills like Tom and Jerry are doing here. <laughs> well, I've been there. I already tried that. It doesn't work. But let me, like, let me just add this about the influx of street art in the gallery scene and how that's coming home with people. It's because people connect and people want to take it to their homes and people want to own risk they want to own scene they want to own Gatsby they want to own all these people right and I'm just so fortunate enough to be uh enmeshed in this world where I know these guys and like I know that that work is meant to be seen on a structure I don't want a print of risks tag I want risks tag on my fucking wall because that's where it goes you know what I mean? And are not everybody's allowed to do that or wants to fuck their home up like that or increase the value, I say. But <laughs> that's why they go to the galleries because it's resonating on a level that is unexpected. You're driving down the street, you're seeing Burger King, you're seeing McDonald's, you're seeing this, you're seeing that. And then you're like, holy fuck, what is that? And you pull over and you get out and you're fucking physically standing there. You know, it's like standing in, Risk and I have a huge fondness for Rothko which if you look at a fucking Rothko on your phone, you're not gonna get it. You have yeah. to stand in front of it. You have to be 18 inches away from that thing to understand it. And yeah. so that's what's the magic of the street. And that's why I ask these guys when they're, when they're available to do my house and risk a massive mural in my backyard. And it just changed the energy 
and the flow and the creativity of this whole space just by adding his work. That's awesome. And that's a good uh, introduction into our next session. So uh, I'm gonna say thank, Risk, you're gonna stick around. Okay. I'm gonna say thanks, grateful and thank you, Dave and Padilla and Gatsby for joining us today. I really enjoyed it. And I hope our audience did too. It was really stimulating. And what, I think we all learned a lot. Um, so everybody who's watching, make sure you check out their booth pages on the rave, rave site. And uh, I think Laura's even gonna uh, put them in the chat section there so you can just click on it. Very nice. risky to stay and the rest of you, thank you so much. Wait, are you Thanks, telling me? Let me, let me just make sure I'm reading you correctly. You're telling us to fuck off now, right? Yeah, yeah, you say we don't have to go home, but get out of here. <laughs> By the way, I'm looking at the stuff behind you and Francis Bacon being one of my favorite, favorite artists of all time, the Murakami version of the figures at the base of the crucifixion. Have you seen those? No. Okay, so Francis Bacon did figures at the base of the crucifixion. It's a triptych. And it's the most insane triptych of these really disfigured creatures at the base of a crucifixion. And Murakami took that and took his painting, which is an old classic, like any art student will know it. And he okay. did his thing on it. You got to find that, man, because if you ever find, if you ever find uh, prints of those, mm -hmm. you have to let me know. Because I, I, two of my favorite artists mashing up together on the same subject is just fucking mind blowing. And that's the other thing about this world that I love is working with Risk. Now I'm gonna work with Gatsby and Mia Padilla work. And like, it just never ends, but I'll stop yapping. I'm just way too enthusiastic about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 All right, so Risk is sticking around and uh, uh, he's standing behind two of my favorite pieces of his, Keep On Keeping On and Sunny Butterflies. Yeah. So, why don't you give us a little bit of comment on those two pieces and then uh, I know we're going to watch a video of your, uh, your studio and compound. Okay. Start with, start with this one? Yeah, the sunny butterfly. I love the butterfly. Yeah. So, you know, I have four daughters and they're my little butterflies. You know, I love them. Um, and this is called Innocence Lost. And see these boots? So these are the boots that she's wearing in this. And I kind of use these for inspiration. You know, like they're kind of like my little genie. I rub them and stuff. And I had such a great night with Dave last night. We did some incredible shit. And I brought these out today because that's another story. Anyway, so that's what that is. And what it is, is she was in my studio and she's painting. And I saw her hit the wall with the brush. And I was like, oh, shit, there it is. Innocent lost. And it was like the first time I touched spray paint and hit a wall. I was like, oh, shit, there it is, right? And that's what it means. It's more beautiful with her and the little brush than me with spray paint illegally at my high school. But it was the same thing. I saw her whole mind just shift. That's why it's called Innocence Lost. Butterflies are them. That's her little lamby. She still has it. And that's what that piece is. And it's just like a, a piece that's incredibly dear to me. And I made some face masks this year with that image. And I do a lot with this image. And that's that's what that's about. Love that. The butterflies, metamorphosis. Yeah. And then uh, this piece right here is a uh, metallic tissue piece. I call it metallic tissue. It's my DNA, my metallic tissue, my imprint on society as a Southern California artist. Um, I use a lot of surf resin and car paint because surf culture and car culture in Southern California. Um, the cans are all recycled cans that I use to paint trains, museums, galleries, or whatnot. And then also the license plates are just one love because it's just, you know, we're different races, colors, creeds, and the license plates are different color, but it's just the same thing. It's a license plate. We're all just humans, right? Nice. And it's all metal because I like to hit metal because hitting trains, stuff like that. And that's what it is. And keep on keeping on. It's like one of my mantras. I have that and I also have uh, nobody's fault but mine from Led Zeppelin because usually yeah. when I fuck up, it's nobody's fault but mine. And that's what it is. So um, you can fuck up, but you keep on keeping, keep on keeping on. And that's what that is. Positive statement. Yeah. So Laura, um, Risk, you want to intro the video? It's just, it's your compound, right? Yeah, it's my compound. Um, you know, I you know, I kind of rushed through that video because you really have to understand the compound. It's like my crown jewel. It's 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 like I have I bought two houses next to each other. We're buying a third one. And this is gonna be like after I build all the 
the buildings, I'm going to start tweaking them. It's going to be one big piece of art. It's going to be a time capsule. Similar to what Dave's doing, but like this is going to be like my thing. And with this, it's more so the people that came here and the interactions we had rather than just the art on the walls. And hopefully with videos like this and other things, it's going to come together and make this piece of art. Well, it's a cool video. I didn't tell you, my parents have like 22 acres in Simi Valley, right where Hope Town was, right? Yeah. So when I saw your property, I'm like, oh my God, Ventura County, you know, you go yeah. Oak Street and all that. So it was really cool. So why don't you hit it more? Volume. Too many volume. Um, it's in there. Do I just go like this? How do I do it? I think Laura's got to turn up the volume. Okay. They're very quiet today. So we have, I think, a total of one, two, three, four, five, six buildings that we found. One's a workshop. Uh, it's a print shop over there. There's a studio here, inventory gallery and then my home this canvas is a uh, collaboration i'm doing with david navarro uh we're doing a couple things together we have a couple shows coming up his band's gonna play and we're gonna paint live while, while we play uh, it's gonna be pretty cool uh, these are some metallic tissue pieces that i've been working on uh metallic tissue is a, a series i do it's like my dna my imprint on society as an artist um a recycled spray can. There's no better way to get personal with ours than use some of the cans, especially the computer that he's used for everything I've ever done. So that's why I save all the cans. And then I add a license plates to them because license plates represent to me like one love. It's like different races, colors, creeds, but it's just a license plate, just like we're just humans, different races, colors, creeds. So this is uh, my tag, Risk. You know, I was in VR for, I don't know, 30 some years, and I wrote my name over and over and over again. And then um, I added some talk tissue to this piece. It's like my, you know, DNA, my imprint on society as a Southern California artist. And um, a lot of galleries want some graffiti stuff. I don't really like doing a lot of the graffiti stuff for the galleries. So I kind of incorporate different uh, versions of it. So this is my tag. It's really not a, a graffiti piece. So I just thought it was kind of fun. Yeah, I got all the paint on the way. Sponsored by Montana Cans. Uh, they've been awesome to me and they always keep me very well stocked. So, this is the gallery area. Um, it changes all the time uh, as work comes out. It could be worked up. Uh, these are just pieces that are the Long Beach Museum. Um, it was a really cool show. I actually had a show with Matisse, uh, curated by Ellen Kelly, and it was just Awesome. These are the first sarographs we've ever printed um, in a print shop. So we're testing the screens and all the equipment, you know, burning the screen and all of a sudden. This is the first pulled screens in our print shop. And I saved them uh, for, you know, this is since 2013, I guess, so seven years. And then uh, I pulled them up recently and handed them out to them. I was playing with watercolor and some other stuff and then did them and that's what these are. Uh, this is another room in the gallery. Uh, there's a lot of neons in here. Yeah, I, you know, I love neon because, um, you know, with neon, you can make something like upbeat, vibrant, like a circus or whatever you want, or you can make it seedy and ominous and, and spooky or whatever you want. It's just like, you can really control an environment with neon. So this, this is a wrist piece. Uh, this is my, my tag. It's on the metallic tissue piece. Uh, this neon is, is vintage neon, so it's, it's clear glass with a different kind of hardware glass in it. And I kind of like the way it looks. It's kind of like that old vintage look. Uh, all one was a Pepsi. You know, I grew up in Venice and uh, suicidal tendencies and the whole punk rock thing. I just thought it was kind of cool. Um, I just think about it one day. I was like, think about punk rock. And I think that song came on or something. I was listening to it. I just did a piece of all one with a Pepsi. So uh, we have a lot of musicians who come from here. Uh, a lot of people from the happy hour, a lot of friends of mine are, are famous musicians that uh, I want to jam sometimes. So we got a little studio set up here so people can play. Uh, keep on, keep on, another neon. Uh, it's kind of like one of my mantras. I, you know, keep on keeping on. That's all we got to do is keep on keeping on. Uh, we have Jim Page over there. And uh, another one of my mantras is nobody's fault of mine. And that comes from Led Zeppelin. I like to evoke emotional color. Um, some of these pieces I did this year. And uh, the butterflies represent kind of from, from anarch to monarch. Um, I come from a punk rock kind of anarchy kind of environment. 
when I was younger, and now I'm in a solitary life, a stage of life with my daughters and a lot of stuff that's going on. So butterflies are like the perfect thing, and then they just kind of nailed it. So, and this is beautiful. I love it. So this is a workshop. This is a guitar that can be for Sunset Strip. Uh, I think I did three guitars for Sunset Strip. So I did uh, the Doors, I did the Joe Perry, uh, I did another just art version. So we made four sharks. And the first one we made was about 18 feet when it was done. And or 16 feet, 18 feet when it was done. And it um, went to Montauk. Um, and it was really cool because uh, Jaws was uh, based after this legendary shark fisher out of Montauk. So we got to bring it there and kind of unveil it there and actually wound up selling it there and it stayed there. So it was pretty cool. And then we did some smaller versions. Um, and these are the molds up here? These are the molds. What happens is I, I weld all the way around them and then I take them apart and take the mold out and you can see right through them. So it's pretty cool. This is a dolphin that was originally made for the Miami Stadium. Um, and it's in progress. We're just going to have it. This symbol right here is going to be uh, represents uh, what the fuck, and it's kind of like my uh, my TCB. You know, Elvis has a little TCB with the, light, the lightning bolt, and I wanted a symbol, so I did mine. It's like what the fuck, so it's a question mark, lightning bolt, and exclamation point, because uh, it just kind of reminds me of like the world, you know, especially what we go through all the time. Like what the fuck. Uh, I was doing some stuff with Ed Moses before he passed away. And he told me a lot about the Buddhist culture, and there's a lot of things I really liked about it. So I, I dove into it a little bit, and I, I'm still exploring with it, but uh, I just, it really touched me. And so I started doing a Buddhist series. Uh, thanks for checking out the studio. Uh, check me out on Instagram, Brisbrock, at Brisbrock. Uh, thank you. That was cool. Thank you. I appreciate you joining us. In it was good to get to know you over the last short period of time. I, I, re I really appreciate it. it. It's been a joy and I love your work. And if we can ever help you out at any of our shows or anything, just let us know. I mean, we're here to help. Appreciate that. Thank you. All right, man. Thank See you guys. You. Thank you. Bye. All right. So I want to introduce everybody to uh, Hannah Smith. Hannah's our social media director. Uh, she graduated from Arizona State University and she's been with Redwood Art Group for three years. She's been with me for 25 years because she's my daughter. <laughs> so every Instagram, Facebook, um, what Twitter, else? LinkedIn. Yep, everything, all the posts you see from us are, they come from Hannah. So Hannah, what's next on our agenda? So we're actually going to be heading over to Santa Fe, New Mexico to speak to Julie Schumer and James Kosinkas. They create um, 1228, 1228 Parkway Art School. So let's go over there. Do we have them ready, Laura? I hope. Where are they on? Here they come. So Julie, unmute yourself. Here we are. Hey. Hi. Hi. How are you guys? Hey, James. Hi, Julie. Hello. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Our pleasure. So uh, uh, after our talk the other day, I was really excited about this session in our, our virtual show. I really enjoyed it. And I think our audience is going to love it, too. So uh, why don't you kick it off, Anna? Yeah. James, can you tell us a little bit about growing up in Southern California and all the surfing you used to do? <laughs> We've got a theme. <laughs> Actually, it's Northern California, but uh, yeah, I, my mother put, I was telling Eric yesterday, my mother put me in the water when I was three years old. I learned how to swim in a swimming pool. When I got to be five, she took me to the ocean and cast me into the waves because she wanted to make sure I was a brave little child. She didn't want me to be afraid. So I learned how to manage that and uh she was a big influence on me that's awesome well we're going to learn a little bit about both of you tonight but we're going to start with james and james i want to thank you for your service in the military i know you're a, a vietnam vet and uh thank you, thank you yeah and when you got home from that it it kind of kicked you in the butt to go travel why don't you tell us a bit about your travels there 
Well, sort of a typical story, a Vietnam vet comes home and there, you don't come home anymore. There's really no place to come back to. So I, I just took off. Uh, first, a friend of mine came and got me and we spent a year touring around California in his Volkswagen bus camping out and, and uh, going to the beach and I was surfing and he was playing and it, I ended up down in the Virgin Islands. Uh, I, yeah, it, California just got so cold one winter. I went, I got to get warm. So I ended down <laughs> in the Caribbean for a couple of years, actually working for a native uh, construction company, uh, rebuilding waterworks on the island. And I surfed all alone at a place called Hull Bay, which was a big, uh, long bay, a long paddle out. But I spent a couple of years down there and had a, had a, I had a great time and saved my money, bought a sailboat, sailed to New York, sold it, went to Europe, traveled around Europe myself, ended up in India, and I got homesick, came back to California to go to art school. Where'd you go to art school? Well, I, my senior year of high school, I actually went to Oakland Arts and Crafts as a uh, senior in high school. When I came back, I went to Cabrillo College, actually to junior college, but I did the, uh, the arts program, and it was, it was a lot of fun. That's awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about how all of that relates to your art today? Well, as you, you know, as I was telling Eric yesterday and you too, you know, came back from Vietnam, really had a, uh, my whole mindset has changed. And I really got interested in uh, the avant-garde German art for some reason, uh, World War I era German art post World War II German art, because I was relating to this sort of these post-World War II German artists who were actually trying to take German art and German culture into a new direction. And I just felt very akin to these people because that's, that's where I found myself. And I, I think I did the first drip paintings of my college. And uh, uh, so I was avant-garde and ex I wouldn't, I say experimenting early. So as we're talking, if anybody in the audience wants to uh, see James and Julie's work, uh, you just go to 1228 um, Parkway Art Space and you'll see it. And there's only 52 or 54 exhibitors on our site and you can scroll through and see it. Um, the, you guys did a great job setting up your booth. It looks fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank it's you. a lot of fun to do. It's an interesting way that you're doing this. I, I really like it. Oh, good. James, if you slide over to your right a little bit, we're going to see that piece behind you. It's incredible. That's awesome. That's a big piece. That okay. piece is about 80 by 60, I think. Yeah. Let, yeah, there's uh, yeah. That's some perspective yeah. there. That's uh -huh. awesome. Yeah. I love that. You both have very interesting backgrounds. Julie, I know you were a criminal defense lawyer, am I right? I was for many years and I had a circuitous route back to my art because I was a child painter basically. My, my mother had a lot of abstract expressionist books around the house when I was young because that was in vogue at the time, you know? And I kind of painted that way in elementary school which was, it was not very well received, the kind of drippy, you know, big abstract type paintings from a five and six year old. And then um, I, you know, went to college and law school. I didn't think I would be able to make it as an artist. So I thought, well, I'll take the practical approach. And then, um, you know, when my kids were little, I painted with them in the garage, did all those kind of projects. And then I always had a hankering. I wanted to paint. I just couldn't do it, but I wanted to. And then James was hired to be a contractor at my home to do some remodeling. And he basically sensed that I was a suppressed painter and toward the end of the project he came over one day with some pieces of wood and some acrylic paint and some paintbrushes and we got started that way and I, we still have in the studio the first painting that I did that day that afternoon so that was kind of the start of things and then you know one thing led to another and about a year after that we kind of ran away from home and came to Santa Fe and set ourselves up as painters. How long have you been in Santa Fe? We have been here exactly 18 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, and we've my. had this studio that we're in right now for 12 years. 
Wow. It's a nice big warehouse space, kind of in Midtown in an industrial area. Um, and it's actually, even though we have 1,700 square feet, it's not big enough. We're kind of running out of room for, the, for both of us and our big paintings. Yeah, you have big, big pieces for sure. Yeah. 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 So you know, what, what's kind of interesting is we talk about this a lot is we, we didn't really know what kind of painter we were going to be when we started. Right. And so we thought, well, this, this is kind of like our history go, what if one of us would have really been a bad painter <laughs> and the other painter would have really been brilliant. And it turns out, I think we're both good painters and we both are, you know, abstract painters and experimental and we've, we've really pushed ourselves along mm -hmm. as, a, as a couple. We've challenged each other. We criticize each other. Well, we, we're side by side in the studio. We complain together. Yeah. We, we paint next to each other and one person's always looking at the other one, what they're doing and commenting. And yeah, <laughs> that we, kind of that, thing. but that's how we started. And we, we, we started, we did not know what we were going to do or how good we were going to be. Although I'd been to art school and Julie was, yeah, I, Julie I was a talented child painter. So we did go with that. But here we are 20 years later, still side mm. by side, <laughs> literally right now. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are compatible and your paintings are compatible as well. I remember walking through Art San Diego, seeing both of your pieces kind of next to each other. You can tell that they're two different artists, but they just they connect very well. You know, it's funny, they always did from the beginning, they connected, even though we, we knew less what we were doing then, I think. And it was just sort of by happenstance that they connected, you know? We're soulmates for sure, both You're, in the we, studio and out. We, we, had good, we had good art teachers to begin with. We had good experiences going to- uh, Workshops. Workshops, you know. very good, positive, exciting teachers. And I had a, a, I had a couple of mentors, one here in Santa Fe for, oh, 10 years I worked with. And uh, so he influenced me a lot. And Julie's had some mentors yeah. too. Mm -hmm. So. It, which has been helpful. Been helpful. Yeah. Well, I've been watching your work for years and I was telling Hannah and Kelly um, yesterday uh, after we talked, I said, you know, their work has really matured over the last like four years. I mean, the, yeah. pieces that, the pieces that you have on our site are to me way better than the work you were doing, you know, four or five years ago. Well, you I'm know, like for me, for both, for both of us, we stopped doing our other career, you know, and we have, now we have all the time in the world to devote to this and we do, I mean, we don't really do a whole lot else. I teach workshops, you know, we've been putting that together as an online program, you know, during this pandemic. But now that I don't have to write briefs all day long, I mean, we're here in the studio and James used to be, a, who's a contractor here too, he did construction work here, but he stopped doing that about five years ago. So we're able to really walk the walk and live, you know, live it day in and day out. I bet. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I would say. And you yeah. know, it, it does take a long time to work on your craft. I, what's that saying? You got to put in 10,000 hours mm -hmm. to become a master, you know? And it takes a long time just searching around for your own unique voice. And uh, I, I think maybe a lot of other artists relate to this. It takes a long time to have confidence in your mm -hmm. own uniqueness, you know? Yeah. And, and what you're producing and just let it be and stay with that. And I think we've both bounced around a lot. Mm, to some to degree, find out. yeah. We've tried out different styles. We've tried different themes and that kind of thing. But you know, the big thing is we do a lot of paintings. We're really prolific. We probably each paint between 80 and 100 paintings a year. Mm -hmm. Wow. Because, you know, I mean, I was doing that when I was still working part-time as a lawyer too. So, I mean, it's that means we're here like all the time and just pumping them out. and repainting, you know, all that and evaluating and scrapping some, but the more you do it, the better you get. Yeah, no, your work's it's great. Thank you, we appreciate that. Well, we appreciate you being here with us this evening and hopefully uh, this pandemic and soon in Santa Fe can open their doors again. I know, here. this town is shut, has been shut down for like a long time. Yeah. You know, we rely upon people, to visitors to come and liven it up and, and uh, go to the galleries and all that, but it's pretty empty. 
I think we'll be producing Art Santa Fe in July of 2021, though. So uh, okay, I'm great. Great. We'll All see right. you guys we'll then. See you then. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having yeah, thanks us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, and make sure um, to all the attendees that you check out their booths for sure. We have some incredible right. people. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, thanks a lot, you guys. All right. Bye now. Bye. 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 Well, what's up next? Well, um, earlier this week, uh, we had the opportunity to step inside the studio of the famous New York street graffiti artist, Dane. Uh, I love Dane's work. He combines old Hollywood with wheat paste, spray paint, silk screens, and collage. Collage of materials that he finds in New York um, and on the streets of New York. And, you know, he says, when you buy one of my paintings, you never know what you're going to get. It could be a little rat poop in the thing or something. <laughs> it, was, it was kind of funny. But, uh, and for those of you that don't know what wheat pasting is, wheat pasting is, it's basically an adhesive, a liquid adhesive that the graffiti artists would use to put up things that weren't permanent. They would eventually deteriorate, like we were talking about earlier with tape. So that's what happened. So... I think Laura is going to play a video for us. It's about uh, seven or eight minutes long on Dane uh, that we shot uh, earlier this week. I love New York, especially old school New York. I love old neighborhoods like Chinatown. I mean, inspiration's everywhere. I mean, it's just the streets, the doorways, the alleyways. Everything is inspiration in New York. It's a classic, iconic. I just love working with patterns. So whether it's checkerboards, contrasting dark and light, so to have the C pattern in my work, is just a perfect fit. assume you started with street art before you moved to the canvas is that right uh yes yeah i, I had no idea that i was going to be you know doing canvases and, and galleries and doing shows all around the world you know you're just kind of messing around getting back into it having fun you know and you know that's the key to anything really if you're not having fun then you're just really wasting your time so uh it was all about just getting back on the streets and, uh, you know, kind of being a kid again, I guess, you know, and then just from there, it just, you know, developed. And uh, I did my first show. Uh, I was in part of a group show in Manhattan, then in Brooklyn. And then from there, I've done shows in, uh, in London, in Italy, um, uh, Australia, Mexico City, um, Berlin, you know, just, yeah. all, of course, all around the States, you know, I'm represented by a couple of galleries. And I'm, I'm going to assume you work on multiple pieces at a time. Usually, yeah. I'm usually um, working on three or four pieces at one time. Um, so all based on collage. So I'm doing three, four canvases, this and that. So that's always my foundation is usually collage. And all the paper that I have is, is found on the streets of New York. They basically tore down posters uh, from the street. Ah, I didn't know that. Get a taste of New York when you get a canvas. You might get <laughs> dirt, you might get a rat hair, you might get something in that canvas. Uh, that's really, really New York. So, um, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> do you still do wheat pasting around New York? I do, yes. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, there's a little blurred line between graffiti and wheat pasting because it doesn't last so long, right? Well, I kind of like that. You got to catch it while it's up at the time. I love that it starts to fade away. I, that's that's really the, what I really love about uh, doing paste ups and street art is that it's temporary. So, you know, if you catch it, you catch it. You got to wait for something new. But I love when it kind of, you know, decomposes. In, in the streets and the, and the weather and yeah. everything else. And sometimes it even takes on a new beauty uh, once it starts to, you know, that affects us. I love that, you know, 
to me, real street art is illegal. So unless you're putting stuff on the streets illegal, um, you know, I guess it's technically street art, but you can't be a graffiti artist unless you're doing graffiti illegal. You can't be a street artist, a weed paste artist, unless you're putting up illegal. Now I do some commissions on the streets from time to time, but you still gotta have that presence. You still gotta be doing illegal stuff in my book. So tell me about the dripping eye. The dripping eye was just something that, um, you know, my work uh, began with mostly 99% of the images are always women. Uh, my dad got me into like, you know, Humphrey Bogart and those old, old movies for the 40s and 50s. So I love that Hollywood glam. I, I love those old looks. I love, you know, the guys in the suits and the women with the hair and the makeup and, and the full faces. So my images are always based on the face of a woman. Um, so it's the eyes, the lips. So I, I think the circle and drip around the eye just wanted, you know, people to really focus on the eyes because to me, the eyes, you know, they're like the window. I, don't know, I forgot what the saying is, but it's the soul to the, to the body, the eyes. So, you know, when people see someone's eyes, you can tell a lot about somebody. Um, so I want people to focus in on the eyes and um, it just became like a trademark for me, you know, and I was doing different colors and now it's usually just a pink circle and drip. And, um, you know, that's how people really recognize my work. Uh, I mean, there's other things, the flowers, the collage, um, but I'm really associated with that circle and drip around the eye. Yeah, I found myself when I was looking at your work, focusing in the center, right around the eye first, and then you get the face, and then all of the other things, the flowers and everything else you put onto the, the canvas. A lot to explore, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. it kind of sucks you in, and then you get to explore the whole thing. Yes, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just, that's what, you know, I grew up, like again, my dad was really into those old movies, and as a kid, I hated them. I was like, these things are not even in color. What's going on? But as I got a little bit older, I really learned to appreciate um, just the style. I just love that you had to use your imagination. You know, what color hat? What color was that dress? What color are those old cars, you know? So I, I just really fell in love with them. They're mostly what I watch now. And then my mother loved flowers. She, she loved doing floral designs. And I think it was just a combination of just my mom and dad. They're really um, my greatest influences. And just New York. I mean, just growing up in New York, um, you know, you could move here. It's one thing. But when you grew up here in the 70s and 80s and you just know the streets and just there's just something about New York that's just it, its own style, its, its own thing. So it's, I'm really, really grateful that I was, you know, live in this city and where I grew up, I grew up in a very diverse area. I grew up in the projects, um, poor background. I was brought up in Coney Island. So that's where I'm from, Coney Island, Brooklyn. And I just think that diversity of black and white and just all colors, all nations, all people. I think that's just what makes my art. I love colors. Uh, I love people. Um, and I guess I love to talk as you can see. <laughs> That's great. And you're entertaining. The audience is going to love it. <laughs> I'm Italian American. And um, so we talk with our hands. We love to talk. We love to eat. And um, so, yeah. Well, I'm going to let everybody know to check out your booth space because it was well designed. It looks great. I love all the pieces on it. And you've got those prints starting at $500 and then going up to original work. So I encourage them to do that. I want to thank you for being with us today. Eric, it's my pleasure. Yeah, it was really cool. My pleasure. All right, man. Well, welcome back. <laughs> um, yeah, you should check out Dane's booth uh, on the site. He does have prints starting at $500. And I'm going to add something to that. So earlier in the broadcast tonight, we were talking about uh, Gatsby and dual diagnosis creating a print together, which they'll sign. There's a limited edition of those prints 
uh, of 50. So there's only 50 available. And the first 50 people that buy art, and we've already been doing that, on the RAVE site receive a free complimentary print from Dual Diagnosis and Gatsby to go along with the art they've already purchased. You don't have to purchase from Gatsby or Dual Diagnosis. You can purchase, purchase from any of the artists on our site. And the first 50 people to buy get a, a free print valued at $1,000. So for instance, Dane's print started $500. You're gonna get $1,500 worth of art for a $500 purchase. So uh, that's really nice of them. Gatsby and Dual Diagnosis did that because they wanna help other artists. Uh, they also like uh, have their work on the walls of collectors. And um, I think that was very generous of them. So that's a little announcement we thought we'd make right there. Very cool print too. It is a cool print, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, Laura, are we ready to shoot over to Atlanta and visit a friend of mine, Anthony Delju? Anthony is the owner of Delju Art Group. Uh, Delju Art Group is a fine art publisher dedicated to the creation, promotion, and distribution of the finest original paintings, sculpture, photography, art prints, and handcrafted framing that they supply to their clients. Uh, he collaborates with cutting edge, emerging, and forward thinking artists. And uh, I've known Anthony for probably too long to even say. He does look a lot more handsome and young than I do. Uh, <laughs> thanks for joining us. <laughs> Hey, Anthony. Hi. How are you guys? Good. Great. How are you? I, I'm doing good. I have to be honest. Um, you know, we shut down here. The gallery shut down at six o'clock and I thought I'd log in for like five or 10 minutes to get an idea of the scope of uh, what's happening. I, I've been locked in for the last hour and a half. I, I have been so entertained. Uh, and uh, on a Friday at seven o'clock here in Atlanta, uh, in a long year, at the end of the, in December, uh, I've, I've been re-energized with the passion uh, of all of these artists. And I, and I realize why I'm in this business and why I love this business so much. Well, that's a awesome. good, that's a good statement. Yeah. We appreciate that. I really like that. Um, you're going to start? Yeah. Anthony, I know you work in a very um, unique space. Can you tell us <laughs> a little bit about that? Yeah. So, um, we have uh, a pretty unique space. Uh, uh, Eric's been here before, uh, and I hope you get a chance uh, to visit one time. The, 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 the space used to be an old margarine factory. Uh, our, our building's about 100,000 square feet, um, arguably probably one of the largest galleries in the country. We have about 50,000 square feet of uh, showroom gallery space uh, and another 25,000 square feet of, of production, which is uh, we, we have digital uh, printing capabilities and obviously our framing and shipping departments, but we also have another 25,000 square feet of artist studios. And so when I was watching, uh, you know, uh, Dave and Padilla and Risk and, and Gatsby, the scene that you saw at Gatsby, uh, Gatsby's uh, uh, studio is what you'll find in our studio where we have artists that we represent. They actually come in and uh, similar space as to what you see there. Uh, even risk, you know, where he's laid out the, the, the pieces. Uh, so we have a similar arrangement for our artists. That they come in and uh, we provide everything for them and they basically paint. And uh, we take on the responsibility of marketing, selling and distributing their artwork. Right. Very cool. And just so the audience knows, uh, this is a, kind of a lifting up the kimono looking inside the art business discussion that we're having with Anthony right now, because uh, uh, they're a multifaceted company. I mean, I know you do work with designers and hotels and big projects, as well as there's a whole fine art. Uh, and you've got some famous artists under your, your umbrella uh, that do a lot of the art fairs and are represented in galleries. So right, uh, right. Um, we're, we're a little unique in what we do. And, you know, um, we've got multiple facets of different business units, all in the um, art sphere, uh, handling different market segments. So, for example, uh, we have an a art consulting uh, business, about 30, 35 employees in that section. And, and their focus is primarily 
providing art consulting services to the hospitality in industry. Uh, so for example, uh, we'll do the Bellagio Hotel, we'll do all of their public art, all of their guest art. It's an independent consultancy. We'll work with artists from all around the world and buy millions of dollars worth of artwork. You know, we could reach out to Risk or Gatsby, other artists that you have, and we purchase their artwork and we specify it for projects, whether it's, it's a big hotel or a big corporation. So that's one, one piece of our business. Um, Doju Art Group is, is our art publishing company where we represent artists exclusively uh, and, and sell their artwork to other galleries. So we have gallery partners all over the world. You know, we were talking earlier how, how the shows have been canceled. We, we probably do 15 shows a year. We travel and do one man shows throughout Europe here in New York and uh, Aspen, you name it, out on the West Coast. So, you know, that's kind of stopped this year, but that's, that's our responsibility as, as a representative of the artist to put them in galleries. So we have a distribution of hundreds of galleries around the world that we sell to. Um, and then we have the fine art side where we do the art fairs, the art Miamis and, you know, the Santa Fe shows and you name it, we do about 10 of those fairs. So we're, we're, we're completely art, but in different market segments, uh, all in the, um, you know, scope of selling and promoting artists. I love that. Why don't you give the audience a few tips about collecting art and uh, something I'm sure you and I could probably talk about for an hour, but uh, let's hear a few tips from you. I'd love to hear that. Um, well, collecting art, in my opinion, and I'm, I might not be the most qualified person to speak on this. I mean, I, I, I've, I've been in the art business for 30 something years, but the personally, the way I treat, uh, the way I, I tell my customers when they look at art is to buy something you love. Uh, and, and, and Dave spoke about this earlier, buy something that speaks to you, buy something that motivates you or inspires you. The money aspect can come later. You know, um, we, we have artists that we've represented the same as, you know, the herring piece you guys were talking about where, you know, someone like a Craig Allen, where, you know, 10 years ago, um, Craig's pieces, we were selling for five, six hundred dollars a piece. Uh, we sold a piece the other day for about seventy thousand mm -hmm. dollars. I would have told the, I would tell the same story to the person that bought it five at five hundred dollars uh, that I would tell the person who bought it for seventy thousand. Buy the piece because you love it buy the piece because you enjoy it. Uh, it'll be a generational piece. It'll be a gift to your estate, to your family members and so forth. Uh, so that's the number one thing. I, I have pieces in my collection uh, that, you know, uh, might have gone up in price, not gone anywhere in price, but it, it's, it's irrelevant because I purchased it because I love it. I purchased it because I want to live with it and pass it on to my children. So I think that's the number one rule. And when you get into the blue chip stuff, that's a whole different uh, category of investing. And I, and I would suggest at that point, uh, hiring an art consultant to kind of advise you an art advisory to take you to that next level, because then, the, then you're at a different game where it becomes more of an investment uh, than anything else. I totally agree. Uh, you know, it's like almost having a stock market mm -hmm. analyst managing your money, because when you get into that upper level, you've got to keep up with every single auction house that's selling pieces and what show is this guy doing and what other collections is he in or she in and it's a whole different ball game yeah right but even and i agree with you but you know even even in the realm that we are in let's say you have an emerging artist that's in the five to ten thousand dollar range as, as a collector, you know, obviously you're not going to get, hire a, a consultant to, to, to work with you on that, but you can do your own homework and you want to make sure that artist is represented uh, by, by legitimate galleries. You want to make sure that, uh, you know, you, you can check on the histories of the purchases. You can call the galleries and say, you know, what, what did this particular artist's uh, work go for two, three years ago? What's the plan for the future? What are they working on? So you can do your own uh, bits of information, uh, investigation to kind of see where that work is going and make make a judgment call right and get out and go to fairs once we for have sure <laughs> you have any personal uh collection stories of your own uh you know uh like you said we've been doing this for for a while and you know i i've represented some uh amazing uh artists uh artists such as uh you know one of the top artists right now in new york jose parla while we're talking about street art jose used to work uh, with us and worked in atlanta so we have jose parla's tia lang which you probably know back in the 
90s. Uh, you know, I, I become emotional with the artists that I represent. So I have to collect the artists that I represent. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I do try to sprinkle some other artists uh, with all the art fairs that we go to, but I've honestly run out of space. Uh, so my biggest art collection is in the portfolio in my office. No more, no more wall, wall space anymore. I hear you. Uh, we were doing a little rehearsal the other day with how many artists? 10 artists? About 10 artists, yeah. And, and the one artist says to me, Eric, tell everybody about that piece you collected of mine. And I said, I don't think I've collected one of your pieces. <laughs> this is the perfect opportunity right yeah. now. That's it. That's I said, it. The thing. I said, go open that closet over there. I mean, you know, but it's still fun. I mean, uh, uh, Kelly and I are actually acquiring a piece now from Walter Redondo soon, but uh, and he'll be on our he'll be on our show tomorrow. So. Yeah, you'd, you'd be surprised some of the stories we we get in here with our collectors coming in. A few years ago, a funny story, a few years ago, uh, not a few years ago, actually a while back ago, you know, Atlanta's a big hip hop uh, town. We have a lot of artists and now the movies. Uh, but we had uh, T.I., who, who, who's a big uh, rapper here in Atlanta, come in with his designer. He was he, he was getting into art collecting. They come in and they asked to shut the gallery down. Uh, and, you know, he was a big deal. So we said, all right. But, you know, uh, the younger the younger generation in our, in our organization knew who he was. The older uh, generation, like my my uncles and my father had no idea who this guy was. He they they they, they moved forward and they put his CD into the sound system in, in, okay. in the uh, gallery and crank it. Now, all of a sudden, the, the, the gallery turns into a club scene and he's walking around purchasing pieces and he bought a lot of artwork. And uh, we have people coming out. What's going on out here? Why is this music happening? And it, it turned into a, a bit of a concert. So we get we get those type of uh, events where collectors come in at that level and uh, really take over the galleries. So it's, it's a lot of fun to see. And that was, you know, that was his first collection. And he was so excited about it. But, uh, you know, it, it, it happens. It happens on that kind of scale. Memorable for both of you, too, I'm sure. For sure. I still tell that story every time, every chance I get. And then, you, you know, you get people like Usher who come in or Cam Newton. They, they go up to the studio and they, they want to take pictures with uh, the artists that work in the studio. It's rare to be able to walk into a gallery and say, wow, I love this art. And then you say, well, would you like to meet the artist? And you go up to the studio and there they are. And, uh, you know, artist to artist as a musician, as an art, uh, as a painter, uh, that they have a connection. So uh, that's, that's lovely to see from time to time. Yeah, that's really cool. I'm going to go back and touch on your building for a minute again, just so the audience knows. So the margarine factory had these huge vats. They had to be like 30 feet in circumference. Uh, I forgot my math. Diameter. Diameter, thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, Anthony and his crew, they, they cut them out and you go in there and they're now conference spaces and it's really uh, cool. I remember you guys telling me you were literally scrubbing the floors for, right? Well, let me tell you, our, our, our bank told us, they, you know, they gave us the money to buy this building sight unseen. I think afterwards when they came in here to see what we had to do, they, they would have backed out of it. Your cholesterol level would have gone up just walking into the space. There was just garbage everywhere. Uh, still to this day, you know, 20 years later, you walk through and hit pockets of uh, margarine odor that comes up. Uh, but yeah, we, we had these uh, vats where they would churn uh, margarine uh, and we put, you know, two, three inch acrylic glass on the bottom where the heating coils were running to heat up the margarine. And you had the churners that would churn the margarine. And we, we've created sculptural elements with lighting fixtures. And uh, it's really turned into a pretty uh, stunning space. And, you know, I think as an art gallery, you, you can get away. I wish I could take you for a tour. Actually, on our website, we have a virtual 3D tour. Uh, but uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a unique space. And when people come here, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty uh, jazzed up about it. Yeah. It, it's a totally cool space. I can vouch for that. Sure. The space itself sounds like an art piece. Yeah, it really is. It really is. We, you know, we have a couple of different conference rooms. And to be honest, just between us and no one else, the reason we didn't mo uh, move out the boilers, it was too expensive. I mean, it was genuinely th this place had a lot of these massive pieces of equipment and, and machinery. Uh, so we turned it into art. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we can do that uh, with being in the art business. So it turned out to be really nice. Nice. Great. Well, Anthony, I appreciate it. And anybody who's watching, you can uh, uh, 
go to the Dell Zoo booth space on our site and shop around there and then also hit up your website. You want to give me your website, Anthony? Uh, sure. Uh, DellZooArtGroup.com is uh, our website. Uh, another website you can go to is Scope Fine Art, which is more retail driven where they can uh, go to the website. Del Jew Art Group's got a password protection for our galleries, but scopefineart.com is someplace they can go. Definitely check that out. That's awesome. Hey, thanks, man. Have a happy Good to see you. Same to you guys. My best. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Have a great night. It's been great. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, uh, where are we heading next, Hannah? I say we go bring it home to the Coachella Valley, and we'll talk to Tyson Knight, where we can talk about pop art from the 60s to today. Sounds good. Tyson. There we go. There you are. How are you? Good, good. How you doing? Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> As we were talking the other day, so just so the audience knows, Tyson and I have never met, nor Hannah and Tyson, but uh, we're neighbors. Uh, Tyson's yeah. over Palm Springs, and you know we live in Palm Desert. And uh, so it, I told Tyson, I said we're going to have to get together for lunch as soon as this pandemic is or, over and talk about art. Actually, I was going to have you here, but I'll come there because I'd love to see your studio. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, That'd be re really, really wonderful. <laughs> Tyson, can you talk to us a little bit about how you got into art? You know, as a you know, as a young kid, I you know, I, I grew up in New Jersey, and I have family in New York. So when I was when I was younger, we used to take the train over to New York. So I used to see like all this fascinating art, like on the trains, on these buildings. I, was like, I, I would love to do that. Like I was just fascinated by color. As you can see, I use so much color in my work. And I'll, I always say I was born a little bit too late because I wish I was born in the era of Basquiat and Warhol and they, all those guys, Keith Haring. I would love to be around them. So um, you see a lot of the, the influence in, in my work. But yeah, I started out as a young man, just, you know, very creative. Um, that's all I wanted to do was make art. Like, that's all I wanted to do was make art. I, like I said, I would go to school with my book bag, which is like spray paint cans and paint markers, and, you know. Like I'll, I'll paint the clothes for kids. I would make business cards for people. You know, just, I've always created. I was just creative. So I just loved art my whole life. And um, I just stuck with it. And it was just a passion of mine. I just was inspired by seeing graffiti everywhere. You know, those beautiful colors. I was so fascinated that I would see it in the oddest places. And I would wonder myself, I'm thinking to myself, how did they get up there to, to put that there? <laughs> <laughs> then I started doing it, so then I figured it out. They climb up stuff, you know, you know. So um, you gotta be like Spider Man, kind of, you know, <laughs> get up there and do this type of stuff. But it was really cool and fascinating. So yeah, that's how I got. That's how I fell in love with art, just from that yeah. alone. I think you kind of created a new term for the art world called "mash it up." I was reading your bio, and uh, I really like that. So uh, combining Lichtenstein and Warhol. That piece over you, it's going to be your left shoulder. I can see remnants of Basquiat, the Warhol flowers, Keith Haring. I mean, that is so awesome and full of color. That is really fantastic. That's a big piece, right? That's about three feet by four feet. You know, yeah, so most of the pieces I make are about that size. I kind of, that's like the standard size I go with. And sometimes I go smaller. Depends on my client or you know, I'll go bigger, of course, and wall mural size. But yeah, so I, that's my standard size, you know, three feet by four feet, yeah. And so do you uh, sketch it out first before you paint it with a pencil or anything, or do you just start painting? No, I just, uh, you know, I just start painting. What happens, I, I'll just, I'll just get like ideas. I can just be doing anything and just get inspired. Um, and I'll watch some art documentaries and I'll just get inspired and I'll just start painting and the ideas will come to me. Actually, the Masterpiece Mashup actually came to me uh, because of the pandemic. I had the idea to do the Masterpiece Mashup, but it really came to me during the pandemic. Like I was home, I lived alone. So I was here for like three months, like just staring at the walls, right? So I just really dug deep into my creativity. And, and this is what I came up with. I always, these guys always inspired me. I said, how can I make, um, put three paintings into one? So that's why I came up with this particular style. So, yeah. Very cool. <laughs> Wait, I want to I wanna make sure that is, is those people that are the, the audience that are listening, if you're kind of shopping through the site right now and looking for Tyson's work, 
go to Studio Jackie because Tyson is listed mm -hmm. under Studio Jackie as the exhibitor name. So make sure you look at a lot of his work as we're talking here. So yeah, and you have a very cool piece on there. I know about um, the nurses and the pandemic. Yes, yes, yeah. it's um, that, that one. I wanted to pay homage to the uh, essential workers and the frontline workers. I thought that was really important to do that. And I was home painting, and I would, I would. Uh, when the pandemic happened, I actually figured out what was important job. What jobs were before the pandemic? I thought you know every job was important. I thought my job was important. I you know you actually got to find out what was important. Like working at McDonald's was important, <laughs> you know? Um, but, you know, essential workers, you know, um, health workers, uh, they, those jobs were so essential and they were in the battlefields every day when this pandemic hit. So I just said, you know what, I'm gonna make a masterpiece mashup of nurses, you know? And I wanted it to be, I wanted to put some diversity in it as well. So plus, you know, all the other things we've gone through in society on top of the pandemic. So. I wanted to, you know, just give people hope and inspiration and use diversity, you know, the frontline work is just to, you know, pay homage. So when I posted it, um, I tagged a few of the uh, hospitals in the area and they, you know, they responded and said, yeah. So awesome. Hopefully it inspired them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great way to honor them for sure. And what are you currently working on? Uh, actually, tomorrow I'm going to be starting a wall mural at a private, uh, private home in Palm Springs. Yeah, so I'm working on that. That's what I'm currently working on. And then after that, I have an idea where I'm going to do another masterpiece mashup, but more with uh, abstract art. I would, and I'm going to use these different new colors because I do a lot of work with uh, Dun Edwards, and they gave me some uh, paint uh, from Ireland. Um, so I'm going to use that and see it's something new. I'm going to try. I'm going to experiment with and see how it comes out. So yeah, so that's what I'm working on. Yeah. How many? Plus, I do my mentoring with the kids through Zoom. That's okay. great. Kids. Go back. Go back to that. What was that? I do mentoring through Zoom for uh, Unified School District. So I mentor, um, you know, at-risk youth um, through the Zoom. And, you know, I used to do it in person, but now, you know, pandemic happened. So um, it's pretty tough to keep them engaged uh, through Zoom. But I think the work I'm doing is very important. And um, I was a troubled teen, you know, at some point in my life. So um, the kids actually, um, they're drawn to me. So, you know, I, I, I don't take that for granted. And I make sure that I inspire them. So we paint. Um, actually, I, had, I don't know. I, did, I had a painting that I was painting with them. We were doing uh, the seven habits. You see seven habits that they uh, have to have in life. So habit number one was be proactive. So we use Cesar Chavez to represent be proactive. And I think habit number two was be, uh, begin with the end in mind. Uh, we use Kobe Bryant for that one. So I would create the uh, small canvases, our mock-up canvases for them drop them off at the schools, the school would send it to their homes, and then I'll get on a Zoom and we'll paint together. And um, so, yeah, so that's something that's really cool. So we have to have it three, number three now, habit number three, which is um, put first things first. So I, I'm teaching them life skills, and so they can take this with them as young men, and you know, be prosperous young men in their lives. So that's yeah. really cool. And yeah. they'll remember that forever, I'm sure. Yeah, they will, because I did, when you know, when I had mentors and people impacted me. Um, it, it definitely made a difference in my life. So if they're out there, thank you. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. And again, you can check out Tyson's work under Studio Jackie on the Rave website. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I'll hit you <laughs> when the pandemic's yeah. over. Absolutely. I'm going to hold you to it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, man. Bye. What are we doing now, Hannah? I say we go back to New York and talk to Jason Naylor. Jason is an award-winning artist, designer, creative director, and he's based in Brooklyn. So welcome, Jason. I think Jason is our last artist tonight. He right? is, yeah. Yeah. Hey, how are you? There he Fabulous. is. How are you? Great. What's with that gravelly voice? Um. I think this is my voice. Does it sound more there? Could be Zoom. <laughs> Could be Zoom. The Zoom effect. Yeah. Is it crackling? What is it? Yeah, it sounds like you're kind of in a tin. We've got tin cans and we're talking to each other a little bit. Oh, that's not cool. Um, oh, yeah, you're good. Now you're, you're good. good. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. 
So, Jason, a guy from Salt Lake City, Utah, BYU, and now you're in New York City. Tell us about that. Yeah, I, I'm from Salt Lake City. Went to BYU. Um, I think I was designed to be in New York. So from the age of 16, I had a heart in New York, even though I was in Lake, I, I finished schooling for you. I'm ready to get out here. And I've been here ever since. As soon as I finished school, I was on the first day out, basically, and look back. So I am. All right. Uh, your voice is getting tweaked again. So let's try that. Say something. Um, no. You know what you can do is, might be my hands. Let me take it. Hold on. Okay. Oh, I'm glad you have the paintings behind you. Those are awesome. Yeah. Now you're muted. Yeah, now we can't hear you. All right. Take your time. Laura, do you have any suggestions for Jason? I think he's going to figure it out, but I can show his work. How's that? Can you hear me now? Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, it's the damn headphones. See? Good job. Excellent. I'm glad we got to the bottom of that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so BYU to New York City, and then you actually, who did you work for? You worked for Mac, right? Yeah. So when I got to New York City, I began working as a graphic designer for Mac Cosmetics, and I had studied graphic design in school. So that's what I was here to do. I, I, I've always painted, I've always been an artist, but I had this like, I've got to make money sort of idea in my head and graphic design was the solution for that. I also love technology. I've always been like comfortable with computers. So it was kind of a fit, you know? And I started working as a graphic designer. I worked for Mac for six years. And during that time, I did a lot of cool work, but I started to feel this feeling of like, I am not doing my own stuff. Like I'm doing great projects, I'm working with celebrities, like I'm doing all these cool things, except for I don't get to put my name at the bottom. You know, I didn't get to sign the work, so to speak. And that started to be a problem for me. Um, I think deep down, that's what I needed and wanted. So after six years at Mac, I, I went out on my own and I've been on my own being a full-time artist since. That's awesome. And I really love the two pieces you have on the Rave site. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, so my, my work is, is message driven. I, I love to use words and being a graphic designer, typography is a big part of my practice. But more than that, I, I like to explore this idea of like communicating emotions and feelings. And I love when someone is able to express something and, and then it resonates with another person and this like click that happens when people communicate effectively. I, I really like that. So I explore that in my work using words and phrases. Um, so a lot of my pieces on the street, my murals are very direct. Like there's a message, you know, that it'll say spread love or something. And it's very literal. Uh, my paintings, I, I wanted to make a little bit more abstract and I wanted to make it feel like it wasn't just in your face. You know, when you look at my painting, Maybe you know that it says love or that, or that there's a, a message to it, but I want you to think more. I want you to maybe feel and understand the painting in your own way. You know, I don't want to just put the words in your mouth. That's really cool. The love piece totally reminded me, the guys from my era, Sergeant Pepper and the Beatles and the colors and the feel. It was really, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. thank you. And that's a big piece. Yeah, it's so the love piece is it's three pieces and they are 40 by 60. So together it's pretty huge. And I like it as a triptych. It, I, you know, each piece by itself is kind of abstract, but when you line them up, then it completes the message. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. Really cool. And you're, pa you. you're painting with both acrylic and spray paint and right. Yeah, so I use spray paint to get the blending. You can see in the painting behind me. Um, I like to use gradients because I feel like it, it enhances the color even more. And rather than just having like red and yellow and pink, if you blend the three, now you've got like 30 colors, you know, and I, I feel like that's really impactful. 
So I do the blending with the spray paint, then I come back with acrylic and do the flat solid colors. Yeah. And your, your, your paintings are super clean and fresh. I yeah. really enjoy that about them. It's, it totally draws you in. And then the use of the black is, is just terrific. Thank you. I really like them. It really is. And I hope um, we can see you in New York when we return for Art Expo in 2021, for sure. I, yeah, I hope so too. I mean, are people going to be traveling? Like, <laughs> I know. I hope so. I hope so. I hope so too. I mean, that's how we make our living, putting on these live events. And we haven't done one since last December. It's crazy. So, but yeah, if we, we, we plan on coming back to New York next year, for sure. A couple times, actually, with a couple shows. Cool. So, um, we'll get together and uh, go to dinner and uh, you can show us your studio and all that. Yeah. Cool. Oh, I'd love to. Anytime. Yeah. Yeah. Kelly's up there taking notes right now. My wife's <laughs> like, okay, we're going to go see Jason. Yeah, cool. Well, there's a lot of good street art around me too. So we can, you know, hit a couple of pieces, get something to eat, and then I'll show you my studio. Very cool. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Oh my God, it's my great pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And for all of those watching, make sure to check out um, Jason's pieces on our site for sure. Thanks, Jason. Thank you guys. Talk to you later. Have a good right. night. You too. Bye. Well, everybody, uh, We've met some, there's like nine minutes left in our event tonight. We've uh, met some incredible artists tonight. And I think Anthony kind of summed it up. He was like, now I know why I got in this business. Totally. You know, um, uh, and please check out their sites and, and, you know, help them out if you can by buying a piece of work. And remember, you get a, a free print by Gatsby and dual diagnosis if uh, valued at $1,000 if you do do that. I'm just gonna shout out four more artists before we sign off. Uh, the first one is Kathleen Warner. I loved her paintings when I saw them. They're so precise, geometric paintings in these large sculptures that are a must see. One of my favorite pieces on her site is a uh, um, Itazan chair. It's a huge sculpture. Uh, and so well priced. Um, there's some of her geometric work. And then as you scroll down a little more, Laura, I think you'll see that. Yeah, look at that huge chair on the left is uh, for 14,500. Ooh, a spider. Uh, crawl, crawling across Hannah's computer. Uh, it's so cool. Um, the second one is Kiki Sterling Gallery. Um, that was really weird, everybody. The spider crawled right up on the computer, <laughs> right across the chair. Kiki Sterling Gallery. Uh, I really liked her piece called Paris Abstract. Uh, you know, big fan of Paris. Love going there. Haven't been there in two years, but got to get back soon. Uh, and I thought, you know, uh, $3,000 is, that's a really good price for a lot of art. And I loved that piece. Um, I do too, yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a cool piece. I might even consider it myself. And if you're into minimalism work, you've got to check out Ana Leal from Brazil. She's a photographer and her work is extremely well done and really evokes a feeling of peace. So her work is pretty great. Yeah, it really is. Plus she has a Ana Leal from Brazil. <laughs> uh, these, these pieces are incredible. They're photographs that she uh, tweaks to create these kind of uh, geometric abstract, you know, kind of uh, photographs that are really cool. And again, well-priced. And the last one is a shout out to uh, Shalan Grant from Calgary, Canada. Uh, you've got to check out her piece called Hello. Uh, I think Laura is going to bring it up. I surprised her with this one. Um, it's a, it has a neon component and it's well-priced. I mean, look at this piece with neon for, how much is it? $850, right? $950. $950, that's very uh, cool. That's a super deal. And it's really inexpensive with neon. Um, and she's a really good abstract artist um, that has recently joined uh, our family. So we love that. Um, you can continue getting free freight all through December. Uh, there's 54 artists on the rave site. And um, that's it for tonight. If you want to join us tomorrow, and I hope you do, our focus is the new contemporary. 
Yeah, and we're going to um, talk to 10 artists and go inside their studio as well. So you definitely don't want to miss it. We're going to meet the owner of Blue Gallery out of Delray Beach, Florida, Rami Rotkoff. Uh, and we're going to have more intriguing conversations and insights into the art world. Laura, let's uh, reveal that dual diagnosis video. And my glass is empty, but cheers to you all. We'll see you tomorrow. Yeah.